Hi, I'm Wim Bogars from Ghent University and iMac and I'll be talking to you about programmable photonic circuits for linear processing. Now, if we think about programmable photonics and with the word programming, what comes to mind is devices that can be configured or reconfigured in software. While with photonics, we think about manipulating light, preferably on a very small submicron scale. So if you bring two of those together with programmable photonics, what you get is manipulation of light on a small scale. Now, where does that take us? Why do we want to use this? Well, because light contains information and we can do things with that. For instance, if you take a beam of light, you can encode information in the total power and how you modulate that power over time. But there's also a spatial intensity profile, a phase profile, wavelength, polarization, etc. Now, you can use that to do things for material processing, for displays and lighting, for fiber optic communication, for sensing. Those are all very common applications for photonic integrated circuits. Now, can we use photonic integrated circuits for computing? Well, if we look at where photonics is used in computing nowadays, it's mostly in the interconnects. And that's logical because photonics is really good for transferring information. An optical link is very simple. You take a light source like a laser, you put a high speed electrical signal onto it, and then at the output, you convert with a photodetector that modulated light back into a high speed electrical signal. And these electrical signals can be up to 100 gigabit per second. However, the attractiveness of photonics is that your light actually has a much larger bandwidth than this 100 gigahertz. You, you essentially have about 40 terahertz of bandwidth at your disposal to modulate your electrical signals. Now, that capacity is way larger than you can ever address with just electronics. So the trick is, with photonics is to chop up that bandwidth into small pieces that can all modulate a high speed electrical signal. And that brings us to what we call the wavelength division multiplexing. Instead of a single link like this one, we just use a parallel link operating at different wavelengths, which are then combined with a multiplexer into a single optical channel and unraveled at the, out, at, at the uh, receiving side with a demultiplexer and different photodetectors. Now that same that that trick of wavelength division multiplexing allows us to scale the bandwidth or, or the information of a fiber to tens of terahertz tens of terabits per second always almost up to petabits per second now the same trick of wavelength division multiplexing the fact that you have that bandwidth can also be leveraged for computing for instance last month there were two publications in the same issue of nature which built an optical convolution processor to calculate convolutions in real time using wavelength division multiplexing. Now, if you start building things like this to do calculations, you have to keep in mind that computing with light is very different than computing with electrons. Electrons are fermions with the, in, which interact very strongly, which means that it's quite easy to make binary logic with these devices. On the other hand, photons are weakly or hardly interacting bosons. So they have poor nonlinearities. But on the other hand, they, that allows you to do linear analog operations because they also can be manipulated as waves. Now, can we do real optical information processing with photons? Well, let's just look at a classical way of information processing with light. If you have a beam of light with a certain intensity profile and phase profile, you can now propagate that beam of light through free space and you see that it changes. Essentially, the beam of light is solving a, an integral equation. If you now change the medium through which the beam of light propagates, you change the kernel of the integral. And that's, for instance, what you can do with a lens. If you add a lens in the path of the beam of light, you're now performing a real-time Fourier transformation between the input and the output plane, the two focal planes of the lens. So you can stack these elements together to make more complicated uh, information processing. Now, if you want to do this in a more programmable way, you need to come up with ways to manipulate such a system in real time. And this can, for instance, be done by using spatial light modulators. In that case, you discretize your beam of light into pixels at the input with a spatial light modulator, at the output 
with a, at the output with a photo detector or a detector array or an imager. Now, a, a very simple example of such a processor is this one, where you have a 4F system consisting of two lenses. You have a spatial light modulator in the input plane, then one in the Fourier plane, which contains the Fourier tran which will get the Fourier transform of the input plane, which is then mixes with, mixed with a pre-calculated kernel, and then Fourier transformed again jointly into the output plane, which gives you a convolution of the input with the kernel. Now, such a system has already been built. This is an example from the company Optalysis, which has incorporated a full 4F optical system onto a plug-in card that you can plug into your computer to do real-time, uh, very fast convolutions. Now, if you want to generalize this kind of processing, you need a way to build a photonic system that can generate an arbitrary transmission matrix between your input pixels and your output pixels. And the first to come up with a good idea to implement such a general purpose uh, system was REC in 94, who proposed to use a matrix of tunable phase shifters and tunable beam splitters to transform a discretized beam into any other combination of discretized beam and build an arbitrary transmission matrix. Now that idea was then later picked up by David Miller, who also incorporated the idea of monitor detectors and control algorithms to make these systems self-configuring. But still, if you have a, if you have a, a system built out of discrete components, you have to be able to scale up something like this to a much larger system, which then becomes quite complicated. Just an example, again, from very recently published in Science, is this 100 mode interferometer circuits that uh, have been uh, constructed to demonstrate quantum supremacy. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you could build such a system in a much more stable way that doesn't require all this stringent mechanical control? And that's what happens when you start integrating photonics on a chip. Just like with electronics, you get a lot of benefits when you integrate many functions on a chip. You can get better complexity, you, get, you gain performance at the same time your power consumption and your costs goes down. So the benefits of scale help you here to make these large scale uh, photonic systems. So how would you translate this general purpose transmission matrix onto a circuit? Well, the principle is sketched here. You make a waveguide circuit where you interconnect. It's a giant interferometer circuit where you interconnect what we call two by two optical gates. And a two by two optical gate is essentially, it performs the function of a beam splitter and a phase shifter. So essentially what it gives you is a two by two element where your input light is split over the two way output waveguides with a programmable coupling fraction. And you also can control the phase between the two output waveguides uh, relative to one another. And that's very easy to implement on a, on a waveguide circuit. Essentially what you need is a Maxander interferometer where you have a, 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 a 3dB beam splitter, a phase shifter and a 3dB combiner. And that gives you control of the coupling by just tuning that red phase shifter. And if you now add an additional phase shifter in any of these positions, you can now control arbitrarily your uh, phase relation between your inputs, uh, two outputs. And you can organize these gates in many different ways. So you can make, organize them in a rectangular way or a triangular way, and they both give you an arbitrary linear combination between your inputs and your outputs. So such a universal linear circuit was first demonstrated by the University of Bristol in 2015, and they showed a six by six matrix on a fairly large chip because they used a low index contrast material system. Uh, if you want to scale this better, you have to go to waveguides instead of glass waveguides, for instance, to semiconductor waveguides where your index contrast is higher and where you can get smaller uh, waveguide cores and better confinement of light, or even to silicon waveguides where your confinement becomes really submicron. And then you get waveguides like these, which are half a micron wide, 200 nanometers thick, and tightly confine your light inside your core. That gives you a scale advantage because these submicron waveguides now allow you to make really large circuits. But you get a second scale advantage with these silicon photonics in the sense that they can be fabricated with 
existing CMOS manufacturing technology. So you get the large manufacturing, large scale manufacturing essentially as an extra bonus, which allows you to make really complex circuits at low cost and potentially high volumes. And the first demonstration of such a linear circuit in silicon was done by our group in Ghent uh, in 2016. And already that chip for a 4x4 interferometer was much, much smaller in the order of a few millimeters across. So silicon photonics gives you a scaling that you cannot do with other technologies. And you see this graph here, which is the shows the complexity of silicon photonic circuits over the past couple of years. And you see that there is a steady increase, which you can almost identify as Moore's law. And as a result, it was no surprise that only in, that already in 2017, we saw this circuit coming out of MIT with 26 input and output modes and almost 200 phase shifters to control the relations between the inputs and the outputs. Now, why would you want to build such a circuit like this? Well, these forward only meshes are very useful if you want to do matrix algebra. If we represent the input and the output intensities and phases with complex numbers, then your circuit in the middle can be programmed to, to represent any matrix. And what you get is a matrix vector multiplication of your, in uh, of your matrix and your input signals. And these matrix vector products are also called multiply accumulate operations are basic operations in many fields like pattern recognition, uh, neural networks, and also linear quantum optics. So it's no surprise that uh, we've seen over the past years a lot of demonstrations in the field of quantum photonics uh, to uh, using these type of circuits and also in the field of neuromorphic computing and AI accelerators. Now, when you do when you want to do just computing, there's different ways to approach this. You can use your light as a coherent system, which we've uh, shown in these interferometric circuits, where your light is being combined in the interferometer, or you can also use your light incoherently by, for instance, picking different wavelengths which do not interfere and combining them together at the very end in a photodetector. And that gives you the difference between processing complex numbers or processing real numbers. Now, if we want to scale up such circuits, because we want to go to larger matrices, for instance, a 64 by 64 matrix, you already need 4,000 gates and therefore 8,000 phase shifters. So to make that work, you re really need very good gates that are compact, that have a short optical length, uh, low optical losses, and preferably consume a low electrical power. So how do you make these gates? Well, the standard way to implement a phase shifter in many photonic technologies is just a heater. You put a resistor close to your waveguide and you heat up the waveguide, which induces a phase shift. But if you scale this up to hundreds or thousands of heaters, you will quickly run into a power consumption problem and also a control problem because of thermal crosstalk. So you need better phase shifters and better tunable couplers. And the way to implement that, there's a number of ways. People have been looking at carriers in silicon photonics, but these are usually not very uh, efficient and they also induce loss and you preferably want to keep the losses down. You can use liquid crystals, which is a technique that we've been uh, using quite a lot at our university in Ghent, or you can even use microelectromechanical systems, moving the waveguides around. And that's actually a very attractive proposition because it's a very, very strong effect. You can move your waveguides in plane horizontally, or you can move them out of plane vertically and this way change the coupling and the fa and their effective index of the waveguides and this is exactly what we've been pioneering in the project called morphic uh, with a number of european partners is to take silicon photonics and take a working high quality silicon photonics platform and then integrate the mems so starting from a platform which already contains photo detectors waveguides modulators grating couplers and metallization we expose the stack of the waveguide and then basically etch it down, add a protective layer and then undercut the waveguides locally using vapor HF. And that gives you the freestanding waveguides like these devices that you can use as a tunable coupler or a phase shifter. And we're definitely not alone doing that. For instance, Light Matter, uh, a startup company from MIT uh, who's trying to build these uh, photonic AI accelerators is also uh, or has also announced that they're using MEMS 
for building these circuits. Now, these circuits are useful. They are programmable and they can do matrix arithmetics, but they're not generic. So they're limited in what you can do. Uh, for instance, you, you still have a strict separation of your inputs and outputs, and it's very difficult to implement delays. So what is really missing in these circuits is ways to provide delays, feedback and filtering all around, basically, you can call that dispersion engineering that would allow you to do also processing of time signals, uh, time operations like integration or differentiation, or essentially converting or using your, uh, uh, your chip as a general analog signal processor. And to enable that, you need to go to a somewhat more complex architecture which that has uh, not just has separated inputs and outputs, but essentially can couple any port to any port. Essentially, the architecture that we use there is a recirculating mesh, where we now connect our waveguides together, again with these optical gates, but we do it in loops, where the light can circulate in your mesh and even can couple back to your input ports. So we use these same optical gates that we already described, but now we use them in a recirculating mesh. And that gives us quite a lot of extra functionality because we can now arbitrarily route the light through our mesh. We can introduce uh, power splitting so we can route, we can do power distribution, but we can also recombine the light in an interferometer. And now the difference here is that you can introduce delays in your interferometer so you can turn that into a filter. You can also do uh, ring resonators by just routing your light in a loop. So that means that you can do really high quality, sharp filter circuits and very strong dispersion. The first demonstration of such a mesh was done by the Polytechnical University of Valencia, and they built a, a mesh which, which had six, uh, sorry, seven hexagonal cells. And already you can do more than a hundred different, different circuits in there. Like for instance, different delays. You can make a delay line that has different delays by just rerouting your light in a different way. You can even configure these circuits to perform as a forward only interferometer, like in this case, a four by four port interferometer. You can implement filters like these Maxander filters or this three path filter at the bottom here. And you can tune the performance of this filter, like the, the slope and the, and the position of the filter peaks. And you can make ring resonators where you can again tune the exact properties of the ring. If you combine now such a hexagonal mesh with additional functionality, you can come to what, we, what you could call a general programmable optical processor, which has input and output ports for fibers, but also uses modulators to transfer electrical signals in high speed RF signals and photodetectors to output high, F, high speed electrical signals. So does that give us something generic enough that we could call it something like a photonic FPGA. Well, people have been coining different names for this, but essentially what you have is, an, is analog functions that can be programmed in a digital way by adding electronics, but that can also process really high bandwidth signals like microwaves. So where we're going with this technology is photonic integrated circuits that can be reconfigured in software to perform a variety of functions. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Now, if we're looking at photonics for computation, we're looking at the processing of analog signals, where we can use wavelength division multiplexing to combine many signals at the same time in the same system. You can process them coherently or incoherently, depending on how you add them up. Uh, and this gives us these multipath interferometer circuits that allow you to do real-time matrix vector multiplication. I also introduced at the end these recirculating waveguide meshes, which are more flexible, but also therefore more complex to implement. But these allow you to also introduce delays, filters and resonances to come closer to what we could call a general purpose processor. So I would end with thanking my uh, contributors, for all the people in my team who uh, helped a lot by bringing all this uh, material together. Thank you.